I'd like for you to join me in the book of Ruth. We're going to start in ver uh, chapter number one. Uh, we're going to go to the start of chapter number two. Just want to set the context of, of the story. The Bible reads, Now it came to pass in the, in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Now something with that judges that struck me is if you read the book of Judges, the very last verse, it says that in those days there was no king in Israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes. So you're getting a, a context of the background of the, the society that is going on in this story. It's darkness. It's ungodliness. So it's showing you that there is a beautiful story of faith, that there's light in darkness, that, that there, there's, there's something different going on with Ruth and with going on in this story. Continue on, it says, And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the, in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, the Paphrodites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now I want to see you to point out the importance of a dad. The, the importance of a spirit-led dad. And they took wives of the women of Moab, the name of one Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Malon and Chilon died, also both of them, and the women was left of the two sons and the husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law, with her, and she went on the way to return into the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters in law, Go, return each to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dwelt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest in each of you in the house of, the, of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with, with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will ye go with me? Are there any more sons in my womb? Are there that there may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice, and they wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and, and unto her gods. Return, thou af return after thy si sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following with thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy, thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that, she was steadfastly minded to go with her. Then she left, speaking unto her. So they too went until, the, until they came to Bethlehem. Jump to uh, verse 22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, the daughter-in-law, with her, and returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Father, in Jesus' name, Father, your precious son, the sacred lamb of God, Father, we ask you to bless the service tonight. Father, we thank you for the story of Ruth. Father, we thank you for the example that she shows, the faith that she shows, the grit. Father, we thank you so much for Boaz, for the kinsman redeemer. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, that you are our ultimate redeemer. Father, we thank you that you paid a price that you didn't owe. Father, we thank you that it's so easy to come up to become a, a saved, born-again child of God, that we can inherit the kingdom of God. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this is without a doubt, absolutely, uh, it's my favorite book in the entire Bible. This, this book and this woman means so much to me in my ministry. Uh, this past Tuesday, uh, my wife gave birth to a healthy, beautiful baby girl. And we decided to name her Ruth just for my, my love of the book of Ruth. If you truly want to understand the love of God, if you want to truly understand the amazing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, read the book of Ruth. I've started it for you. You are a quarter of the way there. Three more chapters, 15 minutes of reading, and that's all you got to do. Amen. 
Over in the book of Isaiah, it speaks of the love of a mother. The, the love that she has for a child, of a sucking child. It, it says that their bond is inseparable. It says, but eventually that love, she can eventually forget that child. Thank God that the Lord Jesus Christ loves you more than that and can never forget you tonight and will never forsake you. I love the book of Ruth because I myself am a Ruth. Everyone here tonight is a Ruth. I'm an outsider Gentile that I don't deserve the mercy, the favor, the compassion that the Lord so openly gives. This book is a testimony of myself. I find myself in the providence of God, scavenging through his field, eating his food, drinking his water. I, I was taking what was mine for my own benefit. And one day I finally took notice of who owned the field. I took notice that he had given me more than the materialistic things and the bare necessities of life. But he had given me a way to obtain eternal, uh, eternal life. Just like Ruth, I found grace in the sight of the Lord. Undeserved, unmerited, free grace. Two of my favorite things is Ruth and grace. This book is a beautiful picture of salvation. It shows grace is for everyone. Not just the Jew, but for the Gentile. It's a beautiful picture of faith and obedience. It's a beautiful example of how to treat people. I want to actually go through this book tonight. You, I want you to leave here fully understanding the book of Ruth. A lot of times we get up here and preach and we say it's a familiar passage of Scripture. We assume that everybody knows the Scripture. But not everybody is a faithful reader or they're just a babe in Christ. So they lose the point. They lose the, the, what, what, the point the preacher's trying to get across, what God is trying to tell from them. We're going to hit on just about everything tonight. So starting off in your book, please follow along. It begins when a man, his name is Elimelech, and he's the head of a family. He has a wife by the name of, name of Naomi and two sons, one named Malon, one named Chilion. It says that they were of Bethlehem, Judah. That tells you right there that they were God's people and they knew better. Yep. Amen? Amen. And the book starts out with Elimelech removing his family from the land that God had told them to stay. Wherever God tells you to stay, you stay. Amen. But Elimelech put it upon himself to take him and his family out of the will of God into the land of Moab. The reason was because there was a famine. Physically, there was no, there was no food. There was a, shor a shortage of fullness. But I want to say, Elimelech had spiritually checked out way before that famine had even ever began. You may not like the drought, but that doesn't mean that you pack your bags and you hit off somewhere else. Why is that? Moab is a significant place in your Bible. It's a country of filth, ungodliness, adulterers, and it's a nation that hates Israel. They hate the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. It's a country of rebellion. It's a jealous country. And they crave more and more and more than they have. That sounds just like a lot like the world today. That sounds like 2023. While Moab is a physical place, I believe in a literal Bible. Amen. Not just metaphorical and pictures. Moab is a picture of the world. God does not want his children in the world. God has such a disdain for Moab. He calls it his watch pot. I want to emphasize, children of God, if you're not saved, born again, your residence is Moab. I wouldn't want to be in a place God considers his watch pot. You get saved, you won't want to be in Moab. Amen. Moab is a place where you can find a temporary quick high from issues that take time and take trying of your faith. So many Christians today find themselves Flirting with Moab and its inhabitants. Yes, you know, to be a perfect 10, we are to strive to be perfect. We'll never be 10, but I try my best to strive to be a 10. Yes, yes, yes. Leviticus 10, 10 says to put a difference between clean and unclean. Yes. A difference between holy and holy. Yes. If you're saved, born again on your way to heaven, there is a difference yes. with you. Yes. There is a difference with you and the world. Yes. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. A problem with Christians 
is they flirt too much with what's wrong. We can sit under sound preaching on a Sunday morning and then head over to Elna Paul and drink a big old tall boy about that big. The problem with that is we can leave here, we are sitting about, thinking about in church, watching pornography, talking to the, the chicky mama that, that's, that's messaged you on Facebook, and we are not committed to what thus saith the Lord thy God. We flirt too much with Moab. It is a downfall, and it was a downfall in Limelech. You know what the problem with Moab? It looks good. Sounds good. Look at verse 1. The start of it. It says he went to sojourn in the, com in the country. He said, I'm just going to go here for a minute. Sojourn. By verse 2, they're already living there permanently. The head of, how the, head of the house, he, like he dies. He leaves his family where they shouldn't be. Leaving the wrong example to his family. Because it then says they took wives of this nation. And we're going to get into it later why that's a no-no. That's harsh, but it's a no-no. Right. One of the reasons God flooded the earth, was it was because sons of God were marrying daughters of, of men. Right. Yeah. It's a study on its own. It's an idea of its own. Sure. Their wives that they took up was one was Orpah and one was Ruth. Right. The reason why you never hear about Orpah is because she went back. The only thing, you, if you want to study Orpah, she then became the mother of Goliath. So if you, I don't want to get hit of myself. These lineages eventually meet back with each other. Yeah. I'm not going to get hit of myself on that one. Bible says they, sit, they spent 10 more years there. Eventually, all the men died. It left the women widows and without supply. It's your job, men, 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 to supply for the house. And I'm going to lay into that one good later. Naomi had heard the famine was over in the land of Judah, and she urges these daughters to go back. She understood the unfair treatment they would receive. She understood she was older in her years and she wouldn't be able to help them or support them like she could. And more importantly, she understood the law. Moses said, if brethren dwell together and one of them died and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without a, to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her into the wife and perform the duty of the husband's brother into her. And it shall be the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed the name of his brother which is dead. That is the name not uh, put out in Israel. No brothers, no men, no marriage, no help. Naomi could be preached on her by herself. She doesn't get the credit she deserves in the story. I believe it was an example of uh, her love, which was one of the main factors that made Ruth want to cleave unto, unto Naomi. But the main thing I believe with Ruth was she was just sick and tired of Moab. She was being drawn to something better. She had heard that the best of Moab was still not as good as the worst that's in Israel. So she decided to go into an unknown land. She decided she didn't care what her parents thought. She didn't care the pleasures of the land. She was ready to start over. She was ready to surrender all. If you're here, if you're listening, your residency can change in a moment of a prayer. While we're going through this book, we're going to stop. I want to make some points. Just remember, going through this message, while you're listening, you're Ruth. We're all Ruth. Nobody in here understands the Orthodox Jew. If not, we're not celebrating on the right, right day. They celebrate on Saturday. So going into the land of Bethlehem, Judah, we see, point number one, she's a stranger. And can I say with that, it's okay to be a stranger. It's okay to be a stranger of the things of God. Your first few times in church, you won't fully understand sacrificial atonement, denying yourself, living right, dressing right, talking right. The importance to know is that you're in a better place. And the reason for that is the Lord Jesus Christ loves you took your place, and through him you can have everlasting life. Like Ruth, like Ruth, there is an importance. You want to transition from being a stranger of God to being a stranger of the world. Like I just said, it's a sad reality that Christians are still foreign to the things of God. It's either because they never really started a relationship with them, or they'd rather just hang out with Moab than the house of God. Those ball games are a little bit more important. I don't judge Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, Saturday night singings, uh, uh, Sunday suppers, help the mission bill based on people who's going to heaven. But not everybody is going to heaven. There's got to be a commitment. If I stop talking to my wife for three years, for two months, we're eventually not, there's nothing there. That's a problem. It's a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that you must have. It's okay to be different. Jesus changes everyone. I'll testify and say, I Try my best 
to live morally right. I have Christian conservative views. And to this world, that's going to be a little bit strange. Christians will always be strange. Because the Bible says Jesus Christ is saved yesterday, today, and forever. You know, the Bible is like this. It never changes and never will change. I don't care how much you want to change it. And I talk about the King James 1611 Bible. Society is on a downfall, and the Bible stays the same. You're going to always be different. The, more, the later we get in time, the more, the more persecution there will be, the more hardship we go through. But by definition, a stranger is a person who does not know or is not known in a particular place or community. It's a person entirely unaccustomed to a feeling, an experience, or a situation. I'd say that that's all of us before coming to the knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's either no feeling, there was a, a feeling of maybe I just don't care. We had our assumptions that church isn't nothing more than a money hustle. The Bible was written by men. God had never shown himself to me except for bad experience of people dying or losing a job. And, the, and God got the blame for that. Sadly, some of us have had negative experiences just stepping foot inside the house of God. And it's a shame when you can step inside the house of God and feel like an outcast. And for that, if you're here and you have ever felt that way, I personally apologize for that. We're just strangers. We were strangers to what God has to offer. Thank God that Ruth didn't let God's people dictate their faith. Her faith and her desire for change made her firm in her stance that she was in a place that she knew could change her. Sometimes being a little uncomfortable and breaking out of your shell has positive results. Ruth was a self-proclaimed. She was a humble a stranger. She was well aware that she had no knowledge of nothing. Only the fact that she had heard of the God in Israel had visited his people. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Someone familiar with the land had told a stranger about the Lord. She was a stranger. She had nothing to lose. She was willing to move forward no matter what the congregation thought about her. I just feel times we get a little bit too high-minded about ourselves sometimes. We start to think that this person, uh, that, that they've done this to themselves. We start to think it's not my problem. Why should I get involved? We don't stop to look what we've been through, what the Lord Jesus has brought us through. Amen. Deuteronomy 10, 19. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Egypt's the same representation as Moab. You don't want to be there. It's bondage, slavery. We lose sight where we were sometimes. And I'm not saying look back. You can look back on it. Don't dwell on it. But God has given you a testimony. A testimony to help people. A precious testimony. I guarantee Ruth. I guarantee I think about her. I tell my wife all the time. Ruth had to be an absolute beautiful woman. But while she was, she came in. Hand me down clothes. Filthy. Probably had old busted up sandals. She looked exactly what people thought Moab as. Moab had beaten her up. The world had beaten her up. Brethren and brethren, when you see brethren, brethren is the saved born again. Stop looking how strangers walk inside the house of God. They are here because they need help. They are here because God has them in the right spot. Can you imagine they're in a sound doctrine church and you just tell them to take a hat off. I know it's unbiblical. They don't know no better. They tell them to take it. They get offended. They go to one of these, these uh, prosperity. Oh, you can leave your hat on. You do this and that. And then, and then they never get saved and they go to hell. It's that serious. A little bit hit of myself, but she has to eat. She goes for the scraps, uh, uh, working in the fields, gleaning. While she's there, all these reapers, they're the reapers of the field. I call them the church. She said that she was nothing more than a Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. Notice the emphasis on her being a Moabite. There's over six times in this book that she's labeled a Moabite. Ruth the Moabitess, the Moabite damsel. She's labeled as a Moabite. But Boaz, the lord of this field, the owner of this field, didn't look at her like the workers did. He gave her grace. And remember, we're all Ruth. Boaz is the Lord Jesus. I thank God that the Lord Jesus Christ looked past the smell of alcohol in my breath when I sat in the back of the church. I thank God that he looked past my attitude. I thank God that he didn't see me as an outsider, but he saw me as a whosoever. Boaz saw this woman's heart. He seen her compassion. And more importantly, he saw that she was in a need. And he saw what she needed 
He could fix. The Lord can fix. Boaz, as the Bible describes him, was a mighty man of wealth. He saw he could give her what she needed. He saw he had it. He had it to give. I'm telling you, stranger, the Lord Jesus is rich in mercy. I'm telling you, stranger, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Your need, not your needs or your wants, but godliness with content is great gain. You've got to learn to be content in this world. Your need is what is the raiment on your clothes, on your back, the food in your stomach, the roof over your head. I am content with where I am. Praise God. If you just come and you allow the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, and I mean the Lord of your life, the Bible says, for ye know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty might be rich. Praise God, January 27, 2019, two days before I tried to kill me and my wife in a, in a, in a car accident, leaving some, some stupid country concert that has absolutely nothing to do with nobody. We got this thing going on today with this country song. That's a bunch of hogwash too. I, I, I support the movement of trying to cancel people, but the song, is, it makes no sense. I got to try to guard my tongue. It makes no sense, the, the video, I, whatever but has no glory, it gives no honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't care what it is, I don't care what it means. Do I love America? Yes. The riots that happened? Yes, they were wrong, beyond wrong. There are a bunch of them live at home, a bunch of them don't understand the importance of working. They, they destroyed somebody else's property in the name of social justice. We killed somebody, let me steal an Xbox. I understand the country's upside down. Biden can't fix it. Trump can't fix it. I'm telling you, the only person that can fix it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. A lot of people don't know a lot about my testimony. I was getting drawn by the God. My thoughts was, I'm going to go see what my brother's doing. But bless God, my brother got it, and he shared it with others. He was suffice like Ruth, and then he gave it out to others. I thank God he gave it to me, and he tried to lead me somewhere. So one day I just told my wife, let's go see what he's doing. We came in, I tell the story all the time. Brother Sonny wouldn't shut up. They'd sing a, 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 a song that was five verses long. And I'd be in here still so drunk. I, I'm not hung over. I was still drunk in the back here. But I was getting drawn in for months. And eventually we went to a concert. Exit 127, going 65 south. If you split from Oklahoma to Fairdale, there's a guardrail median, and I floored my foot to it, and I was going to run my car directly into the median. Stupid. It was by the grace of God that that wheel went back over. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo! Glory to God. There's things we look back on that we don't take for granted. The grace of God. He said he makes it rain on the just and the unjust. Thank God that I was unjust. And he still rained mercy on me. And he still rained grace on me. And he still rained his love on me. Praise God. The Lord loves you today. He's got to be more than your Lord on Sunday morning and Sunday night. He's more than a t-shirt. He's more than a song. He's more than a Facebook post. God have mercy. He's more than that. The Lord sees past. But sees Past your past. The only person that your past matters to is the devil. Move on and go forward for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. Quit dwelling in Moab and just move forward. Praise God. The Lord sees you just as you are. He says, I'll take care of him. He said, I can change that. He said, Father, I'm going to take his place on punishment that he deserves. Whoa. Looking down through the ages, God beheld a dying soul. Sin had brought separation. Nevermore could man behold. There must come a lamb, one whose blood alone redeems, bringing gifts to the Father of the soul made white and clean. And when he sees me, he sees the blood of the Lamb. He sees me as 
worthy and not as I am. He views me in garment as white as the snow. For the Lamb of God is worthy and he washed me this I know. Praise God. You know, Jesus used to be nothing more but a curse word out of my mouth. You know what my kids knew about Jesus? It was when I'd get a little frustrated. You know, people at work, I was getting a little frustrated. I'd say, Jesus, I'd use in a derogatory name. But my soul, God, had also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, 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 every knee shall bow, things in heaven and things on the earth. That every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise God. Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Bible says that at a time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off were made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. I know I'm preaching on Ruth. But can I make a Baptist shout tonight and say, thank God for the blood, the yeah. blood, and the blood. Yeah. Without yeah. the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Yeah. Could you imagine somebody giving you a million dollars? You'd love them to the day you die. You imagine somebody paying off your house, paying off your car. Oh, my. Oh, my. This man died for you. Give you a way to heaven. He's got a mansion waiting on you if you accept it. Somebody died for him. And we turn our back on him. Can't show up for a Sunday night service. Not everybody's going to heaven. Not everybody takes it serious. Nobody loves it. Nobody truly. You, you, you've got to love him. It's got to be here. It can't be here. It's a changing of my mind. We slip. Bless God, I've gotten mad. I've, I, I still carry a temper. I still carry an attitude. But I'm a thousand times better than I was. Lord, People at work know me as a preacher. Amen. And I have flipped out on fork drivers. But it was an accident. I apologize. They accepted it. It's our flesh that gets in the way. I was frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. I had a bad... Christians have bad days. Come on. It's okay to have a bad day. Yeah. It's, the, it's, <laughs> it's the... You know what it is? The crowd that, that is living immorally wrong, when the guy that's trying to live right does something wrong, yeah. they're so quick to point it out, but they're doing it Monday through Sunday. Hypocrites. Two-faced hypocrites. Praise God that he cares for strangers. So not only is she a stranger, she's an, she was an outsider. She was single. Told you we're going to hit on everything tonight, praise God. She was now without support. She was now without her provider. She's now going to a land where their men are encouraged not to marry these outside women. God said, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods, lowercase g. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. God gave his law and his commandments and his ordinances to set Israel apart from the other nations. Everything from marriage, sacrifice, protections, uh, they were different from other nations. Other nations were a result of heathen men making up these made up gods. There's only one true living God. These gods you see are made up. So God made it so a woman was 100% supported by the man. And that's how it should be today. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Now marriage today is seeing nothing more than old meaningless traditions that your grandparents did. But the commandments of this book says you are to be married in holy matrimony. And my emphasis is on the ones willing and knowingly shacked up. The ones that lust after women, the ones that sleep around with women, the ones that watch pornography, the ones that go to bars, the ones that go to these bikini contests, they go to these runways. I'll even put it on here too. While I'm on that subject, it's something that just I do not like. They put these little children that are this age, they put them in beauty contests. That's disgusting. That is nasty. That is training. Train up a child away, go, he's ocean not apart from it. That is disgusting. I don't like it. Lord don't like it. Not what I like, it's what the Bible says. So the ones miserable, the ones shacked up, they're miserable. They don't understand why they're depressed, yet they won't settle down. They won't let bygones be bygones. Age widows of today, different story. God bless you all. You're very special to the Lord. You're very special to the church. The ones in here, you're very special to me. Very, very special. 
Paul said it was good for them to abide as I. Talking about the widows. He wasn't married. He said it was the same that they, they would abide. He said it was, mar- it was better to marry than to burn. That means the burning lust inside of you. We all, we all got his natural. <clears throat> back up. That, that, that's 1 Corinthians 7. You back up 1 Corinthians 6. The context in your Bible. You've got to read context. Right before that, he's talking about fornication. So he goes from fornication into marriage. Marriage gives you intimacy and keeps you from wanting someone else. He said, defraud ye not one the other. That means don't deprive each other of sexual needs. That's out there, but we're human and it's Bible. Marriage is a very intimate, very close thing. This world may say you don't need a man. Usually it's from a jealous woman that doesn't know God or it's from a feminist that doesn't even know God. You know the difference between a feminist and a knife? Anybody? At least the knife has a point. This world says to party it up, live it up, and make sure the world sees it on social media. The world and the devil has commercialized women into nothing more than making themselves eye candy. That's called a Jezebel spirit. Amen. And I'm telling you, listen up, ladies. Listen up, ladies. Men use that as an advantage to make a game out of stealing your virginity and ruining your reputation. Ladies, I promise you that you are better than that. You may think as God has given you nothing. But as soon as you came out of your mother's womb, he has blessed you with something. And it's called purity. The Lord instituted his organization, the structure of the family, to protect you from perversion of the world, the weight of shame, and the guilt of mistakes. This book, this blessed old book that I hold in my hand, has answers for every single problem in your life. So what does the Bible say about women? And may I emphasize, please, Bible trumps your opinion. Facts don't care about your feelings. The Bible don't care about your feelings. If you read this book, you would probably lose those rebellious feelings. You would lose those thoughts about yourself if you would just read the book. First of all, get saved and then read the book. The natural man can't understand that. Jesus called the Pharisees children of the devil because they couldn't understand what he was saying. You can't understand the book until you get saved. You want to get saved. I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the point in there. You want to get saved, start reading the Bible. You can't do it yourself. You're not going to. You've got to be drawn. I, I don't want to get hit of myself. Woman. The woman is the most precious creation outside the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a necessity to the world. And that's why the devil wants to attack it. What my wife went through this past week to, call, to say a man could do that is an insult. But we, we, we've got this, we got this notion that, that you can, you, you, a woman is a costume. And that, that is a disgrace. What my wife went through. My Lord. I wouldn't want to do it. I mess with her. I say, you know, you never had a migraine like a man. I'm just teasing her. I'm just teasing her. She, she did that without an epidural. So what's the job of the woman? For the home, it's submission to your husband. 2023, that doesn't sit well. But both of you get saved. You got your eyes set to the same prize. Me and my wife, we both want to get to heaven. We both got our eyes fixed to the author and finisher of our faith. So it's a submission to each other. It comes natural to submit to each other. Man, God gave me a good wife. I love my wife. Yeah. Remember, Scripture outweighs it all. And I got some for you. 1 Timothy 5. He's talking about widows. But, but this, this goes with women. 1 Timothy 5, 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, yeah. bear children, yeah. guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. reproachfully. Proverbs 31. We use it a lot for Mother's Day. Proverbs 31, 28. Her children will rise up, call her blessed, her husband also, and praiseth her. There's two roads. Please follow along with me. Just like everybody. Ladies, no matter what the age. If you're saved, I understand you, you have the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's your bride. He, he, we're, you're his bride. I'm his bride too. Okay? But you need human, physical companionship in this life. I sincerely mean this. The age widows, I just told you. I understand there's, there's an amazing contentment with widows. Paul even said in that same verse, it's a spiritual gift to have that, that, that content, the content. But the ones that I say that they're, they're, they're you, you, roads, you're either going to be blessed or you're going to be miserable. Both roads eventually come to an end. Ask some of the older women, Christians in here, when there's 60 people gathered in her house for Christmas, when there's 60 people gathered in her house for her birthday or Mother's Day, ask them how many clubs they went to. Ask them how many likes they accumulated on social media. Ask her how great it feels to have a big loving family. That, that, that there's no loneliness. There's not the world. Ask the same woman that didn't choose the light, that, that didn't choose family. They'll tell you they regretted it. They'll tell you that they wish they would have swallowed their pride and just went on with what about their business. Above all, whatever you choose, at the end of the day, it's free will. But you've got to choose modesty. Modesty, modesty, modesty. Ruth chose modesty. 
This book wasn't just a single one night fling. Just because it's only four books doesn't mean it was that quick. This was months over time. Her and Naomi arrived, it said right there in our text, she arrived at the, the, the beginning of, of barley harvest. And it wasn't until the end of barley and wheat harvest that Ruth made her, made her move. There was modesty on both ends, Boaz and there. And I'm not beating up on the women. A lot of people, them, uh, feminine, that's misogynistic, talking about the women like that. <laughs> this world comes up with so many terms and yeah. phrases. And yeah. I just say lost. It's not them, it's the devil. You start getting at your head, I used to have a bad problem getting mad at people. It's not them, it's the devil. Hey, Women sleep around, they call them a whore. Right. Yep. A man does it, you're called a stud. Yeah. The Bible says you're a whoremonger. That's right. That's right. That's right. The blessed and the miracle, the blessed and the miserable apply exactly to you as well, men. Yep. First and foremost, you are made, called, designed to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. You're not made, called, or designed to be a sissy. You're not made, called, or designed to be effeminate. You're not born that way. If we start getting that way to where we were just born gay, we were just born this way, we got to go down to the brother David. We have to go down. We're going to have to unlock all of them because they were born murderers. They were born perverts. They were born child molesters. They were born that way. We got to let it go. We're put here to be fruitful and multiply. When Noah got off the ark, he said, be fruitful and multiply. That's why he lived to be 960 years old. He had to be fruitful. He had to multiply. He had to replenish the earth. God wants fellowship. He craves fellowship. But <clears throat> when we had these children, we raised them in the nurture, the admission of the Lord. It gives the devil a black eye because we're training soldiers for the Lord Jesus Christ. Men are built to defend, provide, and guide the family. We have thicker bone density. Our muscles are bigger. Our bodies are designed bigger. A woman's pelvis is longer for pregnancy, uh, it, it makes their, so it makes their legs a little bit shorter, except for my wife. Uh, Bible says that, you know, that, that, that bone density thing uh, we got a thing now where these men get inside the cage with these women and fight them shame on you yeah. you're, you're going you're gonna to tear them up a woman couldn't go to combat you're going to fight a 6'6 six, six, 300 pound German on acid you ain't going to do all that Bible says likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and being theirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. This world may tell you that settling down with a woman is a square move. This world may tell you that marriage means nothing. But thus saith the Lord thy God, yeah, fornication will send you to hell. Yeah, now, he can say, Fallen, my, my, my reproach to that is, to say born again, a saved servant of Christ, wouldn't do it. You're supposed to be married. You're supposed to keep, do your best to keep that marriage thriving. The Lord thy God expects you to have some discipline. And some self-control. Discipline. 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 Discipline is doing exactly what you don't want to do. I don't want to wake up every day and read my Bible. But I've got to wake up. And I've got to read my Bible. My flesh hates it. It is a discipline to do it. There's people that, that, that uh, they play football for a living. They play a child's game for a living. they got to wake up, work their body. But uh, Peter wrote, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers. There's a strangers again. You should be different. And pilgrims, because we're just traveling on through. Abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. This world is going to hell in a handbasket because of sex. Because of no self-control. You don't even have to go out of your way to see anything provocative. Anybody remember the show Supermarket Sweep from the 90s? We used to watch it all the time. We lived in a trailer. We watched it all the time. We got this little app on our TV. We don't have cable. We hardly watch it. If it's on, it's background noise. The kids enjoy watching it sometimes. It's monitored. And we, it's supermarket sweep from the 90s. It's innocent. It's literally innocent. They're yeah. dressed right. They talk right. And, and it cuts to a commercial. It's, it's always something. It was a commercial two lesbians about a bottle of water. There's a commercial about a woman uh, shaving, shaving herself. She was provocatively dressed. She was a, she was a, a lesbian, too. You could tell how she, was, she, she wanted to be a man. It was, it's just nasty. Yeah. The minds of this generation, they're so twisted. They're so perverted. I guarantee they're going to get to the point where they legalize bestiality and they legalize underage marriage. There's a term. I, I was trying to find it. I can't find it. It's like minor, minor age attractive. It's something they're trying to downplay being a pedophile. It's disgusting and it's wrong and you have a problem. But I'm telling you, the Lord Jesus Christ can fix that for you. There may be stuff you've done that, that man's justice, you're going to have to pay for it. But at the end of the day, you can receive God's justice. You can be forgiven for it. Brother David, what he does, they're getting man's justice, but they can receive God's justice and be set free spiritually. Marriage, it takes both working together with the help of the Lord. 
uh, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Uh, um, excuse me. Uh, Ephesians 5. Submitting yourselves therefore one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourself unto your husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, as he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that the wives be subject unto husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You know, God created this whole entire universe. It's beautiful. You can't deny it. You atheists got to screw loose. Brother Brian, you can't take that Dodge and Chevy and run it head on and make a big glorious Ford. You just ain't going to do it. This, is, this place is too beautiful. You can't deny it. The Bible said that his creation, you're without excuse. The creation is enough for you. And God keep on saying that. He created everything. He created the world. And he saw that there was only one thing that was bad. And that it was man was alone. The Bible says he caused a great sleep to fall on Adam and he removed a rib from Adam. He gave it to Eve and made him his helpmeet. Right there, Genesis 3. Three chapters into your book. The first actions after creating earth was he gave man a, 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 a wife. He made it one man, one woman. Two genders, man, woman. Not Adam and Steve. I got, I, I got to sit on that one day. Why the rib? Why was it the rib? Holy Ghost, I was thinking about this at, at work. Uh, and I started thinking about body parts. Like, why would he give us this, this? I got thinking, you know, I, I'm glad he didn't, they didn't give the brain. Sometimes we're a little bit more childish than we should be. But he says, son, where's that, where's that rib at? I got to think, well, I said, Lord, it's on the side, isn't it? Thank God he gives you your spouse to walk this journey together side by side. No one out in front. No one stumbling behind. Remember the times you've been through with your spouse. It's priceless. You can't take them back. When one leaves his father and mother and cleaves them to his wife, their spirits are bonded. They're bonded. They're, they're one person. They're one flesh. That's why the devil took everything from Job but couldn't kill his wife. They're one flesh. He couldn't kill her. Fornication is damnable. And while we're on the, sur- the subject, divorce is dishonorable. There's no discipline. There's no self-control to stay together when it gets rough. There's no discipline. There's no self-control to lean on the Lord. Getting married is not trading in a vehicle because it's outdated or something, more, something new. Uh, we always get caught up on the one of uh, Jesus said that you're still bound by the first one to give them a, uh, for, you can only put them away for adultery. Essentially he's saying if they committed adultery, like I just try to emphasize, intimacy is very intimate. If they have done that, he said you can put them away. Moses allowed it because of the hardness of their heart. Yeah. He allowed it. He didn't command it. He permitted it. Yeah. Marriage is needed and is, me- and is necessary. He said, uh, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put them away. But from the beginning, it was not so. It was instituted. Now, understand. Uh, let me finish. And, and into the, uh, Paul wrote this. And into the Mary I command, not ye, not, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from his husband. And if she depart, let her remain unmarried or reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. Yeah. Every situation is different. I'm not throwing this out there if you've been divorced. I'm not, throwing, it's, it's, I'm not doing that. Every single situation is different. There's stuff I did before I came to the Lord Jesus Christ that I can't take back. There's stuff. Yeah. We're, we're ignorant. Yeah. We're unlearned. We didn't know about it. Amen. So she was a single. She was a stranger. Leads me to the next point. Very quick one, but very relatable to all of us. Uh, it was out of her control. Next point is her circumstance. So she was a stranger. She was single in her circumstance. She did not have initial control of her circumstance. I mentioned earlier that people think God has given them nothing. That he's given you your purity. He's also given you an extreme amount of mercy allowing you to be born where you are. So being born in a place of such freedoms has its advantages. It has its disadvantages. There's things most of us will never experience in our life that other nations experience on an everyday basis. Ruth being born in the country of Moab automatically made her a Moabite. Remember, she wasn't entitled to the covenant of Abraham. She had no control of where she was born. So for one, she's already an enemy of another nation. She's already got a label across her forehead. It had put her in an environment with no structure, no order, no God, no scripture, no scrolls, no nothing. So finding a husband in Moab tells me that she was raised in Moab, born, raised Moab. It's all we got on her in the Bible. But I want to tell you a big secret. God's plan of redemption is open for all nations and all kindreds. No matter your race, your gender, your living style, Jesus died for all. We're not all born in the church. We're not all parents that find Christ at a young age. There's a privilege being born into the church. I'm thankful my kids have an advantage that I don't. It's positive to have kids running around the sanctuary. I promise you, eventually you will go home. 
Eventually they will get tired. Eventually they will go to sleep. But eventually there's going to be a day where you're going to wish you had a baby crying. There's going to be days you wish you had a kid throwing something at you. There has got to be an up training of the next generation to keep this thing going. My parents, I had an excellent childhood. My Christmases were great. My birthday was great. They had their ups and downs. We were loved, but we knew not God. For his grace, thankful for the grace. I love grace. Put grace on my tombstone when I die. We wasn't killed. We got to experience salvation. I'm different. They're different. My brothers are different. My, everybody in my family is different. And it might come in a surprise. It's a degree of hardness. But sometimes you just need a reality check. But you've got to stop blaming everybody for your own issues. There's nothing in this world that someone else isn't going through. This world owes you absolutely nothing. I sympathize with some situations. There's some prayer requests that y'all come to me with. And I cry, but I, 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 I hate it for you. It, it, it grieves me for you. But your childhood, your addictions, your feelings cannot be used as a crutch because it will get you absolutely nowhere. Amen. Forgive me, I can say it because I've been through it. Stop using your childhood, the stuff you've been through, as an excuse to be a terrible person. We are grown adults and still blame parents and grandparents and the ch- friends we chose to hang out with as the reason to why what we are. Sometimes I say it all the time. Start pointing it back at yourself. You haven't moved on because you don't want to move on. If you truly want to change, you'll change. I guarantee Ruth had seen it all. Thank God for her example. She was so desperate to move on, to be done with Moab, to say I'm done with the world. She said, where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. She was willing to die to move on to a new life. So tired of it. The first step in any problem is saying it's time to let it go and take accountability for your problem. I'm telling you, there is nothing that nobody's been through. The Lord Jesus Christ has been through it all. He's been as a baby, born as a baby, died as a man. He understands it all. She still had a will to change. She was a stranger. She was single. She was seeking satisfaction. It's something we don't like to admit. But I'll say it for the benefit of those that need to hear it. Your Christian walk will not always be a high. It's the lows in your ministry that make those highs even better. When you read your Bible, every single person, these stories are put in here to help you. Every single person had a problem. I tell people at work, if you don't have a problem, you've got a problem. You must have a problem. Serving God at times are going to be more famine than feast sometimes. That's the exact reason why Elimelech moved his family out of God's will in the first place. He was seeking something better, not knowing that eventually more bread was on the way. The devil will do anything he can to make you feel like getting saved was pointless and that it was meaningless. I'll say this, once you're truly saved, you ain't getting unsaved. You'll keep living in rebellion. And you'll either live a miserable life of chastisement or the Lord will cut you off. He'll kill you. He'll cut you off. The devil will do everything he can to infiltrate your mind and get you lusting and craving the things that you used to want to do. Friend, I want you to understand from experience that Moab in the world has no such satisfaction as it does as serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Your earthly problems are temporary. Sometimes we find these people that get so caught up in their... I hate reading it. There's people that are teenagers. They're old. They got families. We had a, a, a gentleman at work that committed suicide three days before work. And all I could think about was his family. Suicide is nothing more than a temporary fix. Uh, uh, it's, it's a permanent fix to temporary solutions. There's a way out. I promise you there's somebody that wants to hear that story. The Lord Jesus Christ will take you under his wing. The Lord Jesus Christ can help you out of that. We let our mind get the best of us. These, these this. Flesh and his spirit, they're contrary one to another. Yeah. They hate each other. They, they don't do it. It's easy to dwell in problems instead of hitting them face on. We start feeling sorry for ourselves. We stop doing what God told us to do to keep us from staying in the world. The first thing we do when we feel bad is we run away from God. The first thing we need to do, even if you don't want to do it, just read a passage of Scripture. Keep on going. Amen. Call your pastor. Call your deacon. Call somebody. First thing you shouldn't do is run to the Facebook you shouldn't run to the YouTube. Amen. You shouldn't run to the bottle. You shouldn't run to the smoke. That's the last thing you want. Yeah, that's it. 
Like a dog returning to its vomit. We slip. We fall back into sin. You know, you finally snap out of it. You've done damage. You've got shame. You've got guilt. You've ruined your testimony. But God is faithful. Psalm 51. This was when King David, this is his prayer. He committed adultery at Bathsheba. He should have been on the battlefield like a man. He said he was at home being a boy idling. I was thinking about making a, a, a sermon on that idolatry. You got idolatry and you got idle. You're, you're being idle. A man being idle is bad. You've got to keep your mind working somehow, Amen. some way. Not the phone. Except the phone. It says, David said, have mercy. This is people that it's fell out. They've messed, up, they've messed up. Oh God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto thy multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly through mine iniquity and cleanse out my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. And thou mightest just when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive. Behold, thou desired truth in the inward parts. And the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There has got to be a point in time where you have messed up. Just say, let's move on and let's get it going. Hit your knees and say, I am sorry. Let's just keep it going. The problem is we dwell on it too long. We think we've done too much. There's nothing you think. And you know what? We try to keep it a secret. You know, it's time I get my prayer. And it's not vulgar, but he already knows it. But it's a conscience that I'm getting it off my mind. I'm sorry I did that. It happens every day. Brother Charles said it today. I had that blessed me today. He testified and said when something happens, he immediately says it. It happens to everybody. But with God, there's an end. There's a heaven wedding. There's a mansion waiting for you. There's souls at stake, more importantly on earth, that are in need. Hold fast to the word. Cleave to your word. Like Ruth cleaved to Naomi. She wouldn't let go. Hold on to that Bible. Hold on to the right Bible. The King James Bible. Satisfaction. She was seeking satisfaction. Satisfaction leads to contentment, which leads to a peace that passes all understanding, which leads to a seasoning that leads to a successful ministry. Moving along in the book, chapter 2, I'm, I'm trying to be quick. Ruth is seeking satisfaction. They've forsaken the old life. Ruth is seeking. Naomi is rededicating. Praise God for that. So physically in a story, they have to eat. Naomi is too old to work, so Ruth has to be the one to gather. They don't got no money. They ain't got no job. How do they eat? Leviticus 9.10 says, And when they reap the harvest of the land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of the field, neither shall they gather the, glen- the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. That's mercy. That's more mercy from God. She went out looking to be sufficed. So when they would do this harvest, if they had a sack and they were putting these grains in here, if they fell out, they couldn't pick them up. That was for the poor. When they harvest the corners, they couldn't touch the corners. That was for the poor. She went out looking for grace. She went out looking to be sufficed. Ruth 2.2 2 says, And the Ruth, the Moabitess, said unto Naomi, Let me now go to thy field, and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. She went out looking for it. Ever come to church looking to be satisfied? Have you ever really came into church saying, I want to have something different? Whether it be somebody testifying that blesses you, overhearing somebody praying that, te- that blesses you. There's sometimes, the, I, I used to go back to the men's, now we do live study, that the, 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 the men's Sunday school would bless me more than the service. Just the fellowship with the men. You've got to come looking for it. If you look for it, you'll find it. So she wasn't just looking for food. She was looking for favor. So when she went out to the glen, she didn't just stumble across some random field when she went out. She found herself smack dab in the middle of God's providence. If you're here tonight and you need help from the Lord, you're not here by coincidence. God did not bring you here for coincidence. You are here by the providence of God. You've came to hear a word from God, a message from heaven. Wherever you are in your walk with God, it is not a coincidence. God loves you. He's too in control for that. The Bible says, for I know the thoughts I have towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil. To give you an expected end. It's all providence, not coincidence. What she thought would be a normal day of gleaning turned into a life-changing agreement, to a dear friendship, to having an impacted lineage. The field she happened to show up happened to belong to the one and only that could redeem her and that could restore her. Thank God as a lost, hell-bound sinner, 
I found my way into the right field owned by the right man. The exact day she decided to go and glean in that particular field, uh, that, that, that day she went to go, a man named Boaz had just been happy to come and check on his workers to see what they were doing. Once you're in the Lord's field, you go looking for Jesus. He has nothing but grace for you. He has nothing but mercy for you. There's no particular reason why Boaz did what he did. He gave her grace. It was just favor. He told her it was because it had fully been showed unto me. He heard how she forsook her land. He had heard how he had left their parents. He had, he had heard that she had wanted something better. He heard how she was tired of Moab. Jesus knows when you're broken. He's a priest that can be touched with your infirmities. The Bible says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the filling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Lord Jesus Christ understands you from every aspect of your life. And I want to emphasize that you cannot wake up one day, walk into this field and say, I'm going to get saved one day. You've got to have a draw. There must be some brokenness. You can't work for it. But let me say, Jacob wrestled God until he received the blessing. He did. You've got, if you want it, God will give it to you. Get saved. Make sure you're saved. If you want to be saved, not go to hell. You've got to be drawn. Do it right. So she wasn't used to this type of treatment. The Lord had given her a treatment that she wasn't used to. Boaz told her, do not glean in other fields. Stay in my fields. Stay close to the young women. Follow directly behind the reapers. When you're thirsty, go and drink of my servants that have brought you to the field. You'll notice that every single interaction that she has with Boaz, with the Lord, is positive. You'll notice that it's always Boaz giving up something. It's always Boaz that, that's giving something out of, out of his, his, his wallet, his account. That very first encounter with Boaz, she's given these promises, these agreements. He sends her away with even more than what she needs. She gives enough to give to Naomi. The Lord Jesus will give you something that you will give others. The Lord Jesus gives you over and abundant what you need. Spiritually, physically, mentally. You can't measure God's satisfaction. That first day she went home with an ephah. That's about a bushel of grain. More than enough. Can I testify and say, <laughs> satisfaction doesn't come in 12 ounces. It doesn't come in 24 ounces. It doesn't come in a 44 ounce. It doesn't come in nicotine, alcohol, or money. It doesn't come measured by grams, baggies, or worth. But what satisfies us, glory to God, is the love of a Savior. What satisfies us is the promises that are in this book. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Satisfaction, who's just a speck of dirt. He remembereth our frame and knoweth that we're just dust. Satisfaction to us. To us it feels over and abundant. But to him it's just a handful of purpose. Psalm 36, thy mercy O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are great deep. O Lord, thou, pervert, thou preserveth man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness. O God, therefore the children of men must put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They, must abundantly, they, they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the rivers of the plenteous. You'll like this. Boaz's name, it means strength. Strength. Bo, uh, Ruth 2.12, this was Boaz speaking. The Lord recompense thy work. He's talking to Ruth. The Lord recompense is going to pay you back for that work. And a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel. Under those wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, and for thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaiden, though I be not like one of thine own handmaidens. She wasn't used to the treatment. You know why? Because she was used to men they were in Moab, and they were weak men. If you are a man and you are in Moab, you are weak. If you are in Moab and you're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ, you are weak. You find you a man that's serving God, and you'll find a man that has strength. Boaz was a man of God. His name meant strength. Men in Moab are weak. She found her satisfaction. The Lord took notice of her. She was gleaning from what the Lord allowed to fall. <coughs> Almost done. She found herself forever secured. I mentioned it before. She was gleaning for months, almost a year. Chapter 3, Naomi has gotten to the point where she understands her old age. She knows Boaz is a near kinsman. And she knows Ruth must make a move. Boaz was kin to Elimelech, the first initial man that just died in our story. His sons died, leaving Boaz next to redeem what was Elimelech's. Kinsman redeemer. Exactly what the name means. He brought back and restored the name of the deceased. The stipulation to be a kinsman redeemer. He must be related by blood, 
by those he redeems, he must have the necessary resources to pay the price of the redemption. He must be willing to redeem it. Follow along. You don't want to miss this one. Almost done. So one night, Ruth goes down to Boaz. Uh, they're working the harvest. He's winnowing. He's separating. Amen. I always like that comparison to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the men would sleep down by the harvest. They would sleep on the ground. They would protect it from theft. They wouldn't let nobody take him over theirs. So she laid down next to Boaz. Ruth asked him, spread thy, therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid like a blanket, for thou art a near kinsman. This was a custom of the time of marriage. Uh, I, I like that. Boaz, Boaz a Jew, Ruth a, a Gentile. He agrees to essentially marry her, to redeem her. But he didn't know there was, actually, there was actually a kinsman that was actually closer than Boaz. There was a kinsman that just wanted the land. But if you wanted to redeem what was Elimelech, you had to take Ruth. You had to take her and give her a child to raise up a, name, uh, a child for the deceased. You had to keep the name going. You had to, you had to have Ruth. He didn't want it. He couldn't, get, he, he couldn't redeem it. He said he would mar his own inheritance. As I stand here and preach, there is a redeemer that says, I will take him and I will redeem him. Thank God tonight. I'm telling you, put it on my tombstone, write it down. Put grace on my tombstone. You got here two redeemers sitting at the front of the city. And I always knew there had to be something to these redeemers. And I sat, I preached on Ruth before, but I sat on it, I sat on it, I sat on it. Paul wrote in Romans, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. The law was given first. The law was given to show you that you needed a redeemer. Those commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, to show you just how foul you are. It shows you how unworthy you are. It shows you how glorious Jesus is. It's giving you to show you can't work to heaven, that you don't deserve heaven. It shows you that you need a Savior. And I want everybody to know tonight that the Lord Jesus Christ loves you more than words can describe. Amen. He shed his life blood to redeem your soul from hell. Amen. Thank God tonight that heaven has my name in the Lamb's book of life. I have nothing to fear. I am saved. I am on my way to glory. If God be for us, who can be against us? Isaiah 31, uh, 43, 1. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. Praise God. Uh, piano, piano player, Brother Bob. Last point. God bless her seed. Ruth was nothing to no one until she found her way in the Lord's field under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ what he preached this morning. She was Ruth the Moabitess. Everybody look at Ruth 4.13. It's the last time that you read Ruth in, in this section. You read her again in the lineage of Matthew. But the last time you see Ruth, she don't have Moabitess connected to her name anymore. There's no more labels. There's no more association with the world. There's no more of going back. You get glorious, gloriously saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're now family of God. You now cry, Abba, Father. You're now co-heirs in heaven. Yes. He blessed her seed because of her faith. You read the lineage at the end. Ruth was just an outside Moabite. Had nothing to do with, didn't know scripture, didn't know nothing. She became the great grandmother of King David. God took Ruth, placed her in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's many Ruths in the world. Babe Ruth, uh, uh, all kinds of Ruths. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the best thing she did was she passed away. She was somebody in power that, that killed babies. But you can find yourself redeemed. I love Ruth because I am a Ruth. I was once an outsider and I didn't deserve the redemption that I got, but Lord Jesus Christ paid it anyway. If you're out of the will of God, you could be restored. You must confess. It's a problem to let pride get in the way. Nothing, and I repeat, nothing is better than the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing in this world will ever top that. Father, in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for Ruth. Father, we look forward to a day where we get to meet Ruth. Father, we look forward to a day where we get to see your face. Father, we look forward to a day where you'll take us by the hand and lead us through the promised land. Father, there'll be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more burdens. Father, look forward to the day where you shall wipe away all tears. Father, look forward to the day where we shall drink, where we shall drink 
from the crystal clear water that streams from the throne of God. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for heaven. We thank you that it's written down and it's measured so we can comprehend. We thank you for it's in a language we can understand. Father, we thank you for redemption. Thank you for Boaz. Thank you for Ruth, their example. Father, we thank you that they're just like us. Thank you that there's men and women just like us that you'll use, that you'll save, that you'll put in the ministry. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for what we don't deserve. Father, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.